gets in marriage and divorce. Religion takes away rights in terms of property and children. Then certainly we must all oppose that because that religion is retrogressive, anti-modern. Supposing religion promotes caste. Supposing religion says that by birth we are all unequal and only certain castes must get privileges, the rest of it you get lost. Then we must reject it. But in current politics, let's be honest, the ruling combine at the national level while they are using religion, using religious idiom, and I would ideally not want it. I'm an agnostic. My, my first option is I want to stay away from that. But they are using it to modernize. So unless you look at the context, we're using, see, India's fundamental challenge now is will we grow economically and eliminate poverty, give every person an opportunity and every child a chance to grow, irrespective of the circumstance of birth. There is an opportunity now. We are not doing it. Everything else must be subordinated to that. So while we are uncomfortable with money, power and politics, with caste and politics, with religion and politics, with a hundred other things, of course, monumental corruption, centralization of power, failure of rule of law, criminalization. Put things in perspective and find a solution. But at all times, make India grow. Yes. Then, then you see, yes, these are some unsavory features in an imperfect democracy, in a flawed democracy. But these are not the fundamental threats to a country at this point of time. Yes. Uh, sir, since last 10 years, India is really on the rise in the global platforms. But uh, there is some worrying factor here is uh, some of the democracy indexes, especially we recently seen that VDEM democracy report uh, in that India ranks 108 in the electoral democracy index. And even the US based firm also, they rated India into the flawed democracy. But but uh, as a citizen, I personally observe that there is nothing wrong and democracy is in the right direction. I don't agree with the flawed democracy concept. I feel that uh, there is a democracy in this country. Uh, how can we see that uh, these kind of the reports from the abroad to judge the Indian, uh, Indian conditions? And will you agree that India is not going in the right directions in achieving the good state of the democracy? Well, there are three things to that. First is... A functioning democracy has four characteristics. Competitive elections and Indian elections are fiercely competitive. Anybody who understands elections in India. Has. Political freedoms, we have immense political freedoms. We are not afraid to criticize those in power in government. We really attack each other and all sorts of political freedoms. Elected governments are truly in office and the once they are in power, they are able to determine what should happen. In all these, Indian democracy is absolutely top class. We are a very sound, robust, real democracy. But we are also a flawed democracy, as is America. America is a flawed democracy. Here is a candidate who lost the 2020 election decisively. He says he did not lose the election. He organized an attack on Parliament, American Parliament, American Congress. He almost overturned the Constitution of the United States of America, which is unthinkable. And he is now a potential candidate, maybe the next president. Even now, he says, I didn't lose the election. So it's not for America or some other country to tell us that, no, they're all doing very well. We're not doing very well. Democracy is a work in progress. It's a process. Definitely, there are flaws. I have been more critical of our democracy than almost anybody else. For instance, there are four specific flaws. The party's dominance over the members, they became private property of individual leaders in India. Family fiefdoms and individual estates. It's a shame. Two, electoral system, we discussed that. Three, centralization, I mentioned in passing. Four, rule of law, failure. All these four, somewhere other than the, the last 20 minutes, the discussion we came, we discussed, we mentioned. Yes. These are fundamental flaws. Until they're corrected, our democracy cannot really reach a, the next level of orbit. Yes. There's no doubt about it. But some of these stupid... Uh, half-baked notions that the democracy is getting worse. Uh, India is worse than Pakistan in freedom of... What rubbish are we talking? Yes. Or some other city. These are all very silly, impressionistic things by extreme elements. Uh, Well-meaning, I'm sure, but they're utterly unwise and they have no sense of perspective. So True. while we should be conscious of our failings, and I have been very conscious of our failings, I've been the sharpest critic of the democratic failings in India in the past 
30 years. There's almost no other voice as strong as mine on the subject. But we must have also the self-confidence to look at your words and recognize it's part of the process and then push for change without thinking that we are terrible. We are not terrible. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, the vote and turnout uh, is close to 66% in 2019 Lok Sabha elections. And by far, this is the average uh, number we will get for any elections for that matter. Close to 66 to 68% of the people are only using the voting rights. How far do you think that this will be a concerning factor to judge the right people to the parliament or legislatures? You know, I have done more than most people to increase the voting percentage, particularly urban areas, middle classes, youth, etc. 30 years ago, the urban, middle classes and youth voted very less. Today, happily, there is a significant increasing trend of voting and participation of all sections, even in urban areas. Second, 66% we think is low. Actually, it's very high because there is at least a 10% inflation, maybe 15% inflation in the voter rolls in India. It's a simple arithmetic check. You know, In India, we simply don't look at logic and numbers. We simply talk loosely. You take the population and you take those below 18 years who are not eligible to vote, they typically constitute about, depending on the state, about 30%, 35%, 40%, states even 40%. And then you see where the rest of the people, how many are voters. In India, almost everywhere, if you take the number of people living between 18 and end of life, and the number of voters, the number of voters is always higher than that number. Some cases by 15%. 20%. So it's not 66%. My guess is it probably 75 to 80, 75%. Yes. Even higher is better. But yes. it's not bad, particularly in the first past the post system, we are among the highest in the world in terms of voting percentage. Except a country like Australia, where there's no first past the post any longer, they now have alternative voting. And in any case, there's a compulsory voting there. So it's not. But yes. even then, everybody should vote, particularly the more educated the more thoughtful people who have some understanding of what's happening, if they don't vote, how will change come? Yeah. And for that, one impediment is urban voter lists. But there's a lot of improvement. Things were very bad 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I myself, along with my movement, did a lot of work across the country to push the system. Today, I say with some pride that urban voter registration has become significantly better. And India is one of the few countries, again, I pushed very hard for that, with the universal voter identity card, with a photo. And on the electoral rolls, the photos are there. And digitally, you are enrolled as voter. You just do the necessary things, and within a week, you can try even now. Only thing is, the last day of nomination is the end of the date, so now it's a little date, perhaps. But otherwise, you can register. I, I checked umpteen times. So things are actually improving. So while more, more people should vote, and this excuse that everybody is bad, therefore I won't vote, is a very foolish excuse. That's why I brought in the NOTA concept. At least to eliminate this, NOTA will not make any difference to the elections. But at least the middle classes are pretending that they were not willing to vote because everybody is bad, which is not true. There's always something to choose from. But even if that excuse is there, I want to eliminate this. At least go and register your protest in a positive manner rather than sitting at home. So now there's no excuse to sit back at home. We all have to go and vote with the confidence that our vote will be registered. And the voting process is flawless, while the political process is very flawed. The problem is not with the EVMs, it's not with the counting, it's not with the election machinery. It's a complete misreading of the situation. And yes. unless we all stand up and count, let our voice be heard in the form of the vote, we have no right to ask for change. So I'm sure even more people will vote and we must persuade them. But things are actually quite, quite good in that respect. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, recently the Constitution 106th Amendment Act, uh, 2023, it reserves one third of all seats for women in Lok Sabha and state legislative assemblies also. So how far this move can improve the performance of the legislature bodies, especially when voicing the women's rights and the women's, uh, women's opportunities? How do you think that this will move uh, uh, the country in the progressive direction? No, I am a support, great supporter of women's participation, not only as a representational issue, more important is, in our country, we have a feudal notion of power. Power means control, domination, opportunities for corruption, opportunities to harass the enemy. This is our notion of power. That's a masculine notion of power, a tribal notion of power. Women, by nature and inclination, they look at education, healthcare, the children's future, 
fiscal probity, uh, prudence, careful expenditure in a way that the children's lives are better. So that's the reason why typically what are the ministries which are supposed to be very powerful in our culture? It is finance. It is defense. It is home. It is revenue controlling land. Whereas women give the notion of the welfare of human beings in the broader sense and the future of our uh, country and the next generation as the dominant issue. So I want more and more women to participate. Therefore, I welcome it. The method could have been different. Actually, as early as 1998, I led a team with um, Madhu Keshwar, Yogendra Yadav, and I think Dhirubhai Seth, the four of us. We drafted an alternative bill that would have been better. Uh, this is not a, as good a bill as it should be because this necessarily means there will be rotation of constituencies. And rotation means everything is by draw of lords. And uh, in that particular constituency, a party may not have a very strong woman candidate. So you're foisting. Then proxy candidates will come because the male politicians will not give up power. Their own family members or somebody they'll try to project for the time being to keep the seats warm. So natural leadership will not rise. For these reasons, a simpler model of political parties, recognized parties being mandated to give one-third seats uh, would have been far better. But something is better than nothing. Yes. Therefore, I welcome it. Uh, there will be some amount of disruption. Maybe in India, we, we need some amount of disruption to bring about political change. So I do believe that there are a large number of women who are now taking interest in active politics. And uh, if they, the parties create a structure whereby it is not the proxies of the male politicians, but genuine, authentic leaders that rise in electoral politics, uh, I think it will do a lot of good to the country. Thank you, sir. So moving forward, we know that ele Election Commission is the powerful constitutional body and it is responsible for conducting free and fair elections in this country. But there is a strong criticism also that the the body of that Election Commission uh, strongly uh, selected, I mean, uh, the way of selection of the Election Commissioners or the Chief Election Commissioner, it is little inclined towards to the government and not giving enough representation to the political parties, even though, of course, there is a, there is a position uh, for the opponent uh, opposition party leader to give his verdict, but largely it was inclined towards the government. So government generally is may take a decision to make this person as a chief election commissioner. They are able to succeed in that. So do you feel that uh, because of this system, the government can appoint their own favorable election commissioners, or can we think about any different mechanisms to select the election commissioners and the chief election commissioners? Uh, middle class and media are obsessed with trivial issues, blow them out of proportion and talk ad nauseum. <laughs> Let me be blunt. This is one such case. Yes, sir. For 75 years, how are election commissions appointed in this country? Yes. It was the Prime Minister of the day who appointed them. Yes. Does it mean Indian democracy is not real? Can you show a single election in the country where elections were, the verdicts were distorted because of election commission? No. So you're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Yes. There were times when people with unsavory record were appointed. I don't want to name names. Even that it didn't make a difference because right from the first election commission of Sukumar Sen, there were protocols, systems and procedures in place. Transparency is the watchword. The media and the political parties and general public are watching with, with like hawks all around. And therefore, while they are in any large system, we have probably 970 million voters this time, almost a billion voters. In a large system like that, there will be some occasional minor aberrations here and there. But on the whole, we all know truthfully, things are as good as is humanly possible. Yes. We are pretending as if there is a huge problem. What problem are you trying to solve? Yes. And two, now, in line with like Information Commission, etc., they created a body whereby the opposition leader is involved, the prime minister and the cabinet minister is there. How is it a flawed system? Until now, when only prime minister chose and everything went well. Yes. And why should the chief justice of India be there in every forum? Yes. And chief justice of India is actually there in the selection of CBI director. I don't know if you're aware. Yes, yes. They're all complaining the CBI director is a bad appointment and they're all partisan. So how is that going to make things better? So this is all silly political discourse and shallow political discourse without understanding the nature of politics, the realities of India, and the consequences. And our perpetual delegitimation of politics is a very bad idea. Improve the process. By all means, 
If there is even a better way, we'll do it. But that's not at all the problem. Election commission is not the one that conducts the election. That's one of the great myths. The yeah. vast missionary of government conducts the election. The election commission is the apex of that system yeah. with constitutional protection. That's all. The yeah. real thing is done. I conducted elections as returning officer, district election officer, as an observer. And others. I know intimately, the back of my hand, the electoral process. So it's not the election commission. No, my God, without them, the world will collapse. Nothing will collapse. Yes. We have a perfectly sane system in place. And even otherwise, incompetent and corrupt missionary and partisan missionary during election time, mostly they become very effective because we have systems and protocols. Incentives are altered. We must trust the system. The yes. problems of Indian politics are not with election conduct. They are not with uh, EVMs. They are with the political process, political parties, electoral system, political culture, centralization of power. Focus on the real problems. Don't go after illusory problems where there are none. And pretend that we're actually doing something to improve the system. Yes. So moving forward, uh, the last 10 years, uh, India's stature in the world stage, it might be political, economical, uh, financial, whatever the, uh, uh, whatever the uh, nature we can take, India has in increased its reputation on the global stage. So how do you rate the last 10 years of the BJP rule? I know even though it is a little personal question, but we want to know the insights of the personalities like you to evaluate the performance of the government because for an outsider, for us, we can see that a significant change uh, in the India's position, especially on the global stage. So how do you rate this? So it's not nearly the last 10 years. Ever since 1991, economic reform, ever since Sri P.V. Narasimha's time, India changed its approach to foreign policy. Earlier, we were all pontificating. We were sermonizing. We were giving moral lectures. People treated us with contempt. They listened to us politely, ignored us. Whereas post-1991, we realized our speaking all moral language, but being a desperately poor and ineffective country will take us nowhere. We have to first set our house in order. We have to make our economy strong. We have to make our people get the services they deserve rise to the level they're capable of, fulfill their potential. That has been the pattern followed by and large by political parties post-1991. In accordance with that, uh, foreign policy also underwent a very well, uh, much needed, a sensible, pragmatic change. That India's diplomatic strength is to leverage opportunities for economic gain. And broadly in the national security framework, global security framework, India to protect her interests. The second thing that happened in the last uh, 30 years is because we have been rising economically, you know, in 1991, we were about $300 billion economy. We were tiny. Really, it's a shame that the country of India's magnitude was allowed to rot so badly for 40, 50 years of terrible economic policies. Since then, there has been some improvement, not enough. We still are... A, wedded to some silly old policies like, you know, steel plant should be in government hands or something else should be. All these silly things still continue. We haven't learned enough. But some things have changed. Now India has emerged as a country with a significant possibility. Last 10 years, if there's any significant improvement, it's twofold. On the one hand, infrastructure, real emphasis on infrastructure and capital investment, fiscal discipline, and pragmatic policies to protect India's national interests, not falling prey to somebody else's agenda. Whether it is buying the Russian oil, if China and Russia did not buy, China and India did not buy Russian oil, the oil price in the global market would have been $250. We actually saved the rest of the world. Not only did we help ourselves, we saved the rest of the world. So it was bad policy on the part of America and the others to deny oil to the world, which is a desperately vitally needed commodity, for instance. Similarly, in other issues, we are taking a very pragmatic line to protect our national interest. While we are a soft global power, we are not an expansive power to harass others, hurt others, or to bully others. And that's recognized in the world. But more important, because of our economic policies, even in the midst of a global downturn, and even in the COVID and post-COVID era when there are some difficulties, India seems to be poised to do well unless we bungle very badly in the next few years. And once people see the potential to rise, that is recognized and respected in the rest of the world. And almost all our policies are to, to strengthen our economy and our global security position, rather than to give speeches to others. And there's another element we should be grateful for, respect of parties. 
the overseas Indians on the whole have done a lot of great service to India. Most Indians, particularly in countries like United States, are well-established professionals with a great deal of skills. Indians expat expatriates generally conduct themselves very well across the world. They are not boisterous. They are not very. Um, they are not identity conscious. They didn't try to uh, impose their values or culture on others. While they protected their own culture, their own style of life, they have tried to um, assimilate themselves in the host country's culture. So they are generally respected. Yes. They are generally well liked, and that also added to our allure. But having said all these things, at the end of the day, a nation's prestige depends on your domestic strength, your economic strength, your political stability, your social harmony, your sense of unity and purpose. These are the things that give you strength. Diplomacy is a byproduct. It's incidental. A weak nation with strong diplomacy will achieve nothing. A strong nation with weak diplomacy also will do well. Yes, sir. So, do, uh, considering the time constraints, sir, from my side, I have one last question, and uh, I was very much interested to learn, uh, to listen from you. This, there is a, a strong support for the one nation and one election. We are also called as Jamili election system. So, what is your view in that? And if you want to go for the one nation, one election, what might be the challenges India needs to face to make the system successful? See, as a principle, there's nothing wrong. See, everybody is vexed with elections, frequent elections, freebies in elections, disruption of administration. But in the Indian context, it's not a good idea. Why? Our people don't really understand the distinction between the Lok Sabha vote, assembly vote, and local vote. They, they vote according to their preference of the local party. Correct. That means the assembly vote or the state government is the dominant feature in the political space. Yes. If I like the chief minister and the party of government, I tend to vote for them across the board, Lok Sabha, Assembly and local. If I don't like them, I vote against them across the board. It's very Indian. Because we created a centralized system where we don't really understand much of the rest of the tiers. In the people's mind, only one election, only one government actually matters. Yes, I'm, I'm, there are aberrations. For instance, a strong personality like Narendra Modi, there is some emphasis, at least in some sections of population, about the parliamentary election. But you ask the people, what exactly are the issues that are bothering them? They talk about issues which are local, which are which is state level, even Lok Sabha election. So there's a lot of confusion in people's minds. Now, a simultaneous election will only continue the confusion. Unless the people understand why they're voting, whom they're voting for, what they're voting for, and which tier does what, unless that understanding is deepened, this will only make politics much more messy and democracy will not mature. If you want to bring in simultaneity, the best way is let the leader of the state be elected directly with the tenure. Let's have separation of powers like in America at the state level between the legislature and the executive then automatically a tenure of office is guaranteed. Okay. Now, parliament, you combine with the tenure of the states okay. as often as it's practicable. That's a better model. Our notion that parliament reigns supreme in the people's mind or in politics is wrong. Actually, it's the assembly that reigns supreme in the people's mind and politics in India. Yes. So it's a well-meaning idea. I don't see any malice in that, but I think it's not really a very sound idea. It may further delay the evolution of our democracy. We must actually design instruments in a manner that people understand more, not less. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. It was uh, deep insights on so-and-so topics. Now I want to open the platform to the uh, uh, to the audience. If you have any few uh, questions, make sure that you have a good articulation. And most of the time, you please try to restrict your questions to the uh, uh, 30 seconds to one minute. So each question, um, hardly we encourage uh, four to five questions if you have any. So Dave, I'm requesting you to uh, give an option to the audience to unmute themselves and to ask the questions to the JP sir. Hi, sir. Hello. Uh, uh, this is Bhargav, sir. I, I'm i working yes. in uh, IT industry. Yes, Bhargav. Uh, sir, uh, I have... Uh, observed one problem 
uh, related to poor routing uh, actually i have in my day to day work so i interact with uh, our fellow colleagues those who are at uh, various levels um, um by default all those are uh, uh, tax payers so when i interact with them so uh, they're saying uh, that uh, so uh, uh, for example if it is their state election for example a person is from up or karnataka or from telangana so this is election day so uh, so uh, have uh, do you have any uh, plans to travel to your state to uh, cast your vote so when i ask this question they are saying that uh, so we are all tax payers we won't get any benefits out of uh, uh, so if you participate in any voting so all the uh, uh, policies uh, all the steps uh, that are taken by government or towards only towards uh, only few sectors or few castes or few few sector of people so uh, as a tax payer what are all the benefits that i will get if i participate in voting uh, uh so uh, no candidate no party and uh, no uh, uh, no one is talking about the rights of uh, tax payers that's what the main concern so uh, i see uh, that's one of the biggest challenge that they have to participate in voting so if you see ghmc elections or in general voting we we, uh, we can see a uh, poor rate of uh, voting percentage uh, uh, especially from uh, ta tax payers uh so uh, uh, how um, how you see uh, this so, one let, let me thing. address this you know yeah. what is government for i want everybody to just pause and think why do we have government we all take things for granted why did human society invent this artificial institution called government we invented government right from the ancient era because we recognize that in human societies which are not natural society is based on instinct and clan groups people of varied backgrounds in large numbers come together live together work together we all realize that there are some collective needs which are important for our personal lives which we cannot fulfill individually animals don't need a road we need a road animals don't worry about a water supply piped water supply to our houses or contamination with the polluted water animals don't worry about electricity they don't worry about transport systems they don't worry about you no know, flood waters uh, a bit of a rainfall there is flooding they, they somehow figure out whereas we need it the collective needs animals don't worry about justice system the strong simply kills the weak if necessary animals don't worry about uh, quality of education for our children animals don't worry about health care these are collective needs i want everybody to really think and understand the primary goal of any government anywhere in the world primary rationale is to fulfill the collective needs which we as individuals need but we cannot fulfill individually what has happened is in a dysfunctional political system for the reason some of which i discussed earlier when the governments are not delivering and people don't see the link between the vote and the consequences in my life the taxes i pay and the services i receive political system is now addicted to short term welfare and therefore that will become dominant therefore if taxpayers some of them are saying look what do i get everything the poor people get therefore why should i bother it's a very dangerously short sighted approach a democracy requires to bring the poor people also into the mainstream and maintain peace and order and harmony and give them hope therefore some amount of welfare is necessary even in america but if you don't vote the taxpayers they sulk and sit back at home and criticize politicians over a cu cup of coffee or a, or a glass of whiskey then you are deluding yourselves then you will never change unless a balance is brought between the collective needs that the government should fulfill and the individual welfare the political exigencies demand unless a balance is there the country will go to dogs and your life my life our future our children's future will be in disrepair therefore we need it we have to vote to assert that voice and there are choices let's not pretend there are no choices 
Today, in the country, there is a bipolar choice. Forget everything else. On economic management, there's a clear choice. There's one voice that says, or one version that says, India must grow. We must be fiscally prudent. We must be careful with money, just as families are careful with money. We must not use borrowed money for current expenditure, indebting our children, and therefore burdening them in the future without assets or additional income. No responsible parent does it. Our governments and our political parties are aiming to do that. On the other hand, we have, we have people who say everything is free. I don't care how much I borrow. I don't worry about the tax money. I don't worry about tomorrow's growth. I don't worry about infrastructure. I don't worry about encouraging investment. Somehow money will grow on the trees. I will distribute the money very effectively because I care for you. Now, these are very dangerous polarities. We require to bring a balance. Yes, we require welfare. We must bring the poor into the mainstream. We must address their immediate concerns, but not burdening the future, not indebting our society. We must build a future by better investments, by infrastructure, by encouraging investment, innovation, enterprise, and rule of law, and basic amenities, and quality of education and health care. So we have to vote, particularly the knowledgeable ones, the people who understand, who have greater depth and clarity. If they don't vote, if only the poor who, do, who are not enabled to understand what is happening and who are not really receiving anything worthwhile, remember, they are the victims. Don't make them the villains. If the poor got quality education, they wouldn't have had this problem. We failed in the past 70 years. Intelligence resides in all groups. Intelligence is not the prerogative of the rich people or middle class people. The poorest of the people have intelligence. God and nature gave them intelligence. But we never allowed the intelligence to flourish because our education is in shambles. It's a disaster. Every parent, every family is sending their children to school. They're paying out of pocket a lot of money to put them to private schools. But the quality is appallingly bad because of the bad governance. And how can you become prosperous or eliminate poverty in a country like India without education in this era? So if the taxpayers think that they are superior, they don't have to bother, or the government is not about them, they're, they're not thinking right. But and there are choices. India has to grow. We have to invest in the future in terms of infrastructure, rule of law, education, and health care while having a responsible uh, safety valve in the form of welfare, but not making welfare the only thing of government. Welfare, when I say welfare, I mean individual short-term benefits. When I say the collective goods, I mean the long-term collective needs. There's a very sharp clarity that's required. So if we don't vote, you perish. As Plato said long ago, 2,500 years ago, if you don't participate, you suffer the bad governance of bad fellows. Don't complain. Bargo, thank you for the question. Let's think in a bigger perspective rather than representing one section of the people. Uh, now I will open the forum to the money counter. You have a question. So you please unmute yourself and represent your question. Excuse me, sir. Uh, my name is Vishwa. Vishwa, can I speak? Yes, Vishwa. Yes, yes, please. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, I have uh, two questions, sir. Uh, one is about education and one is, one is about currently um, going on the issue of uh, Citizenship Amendment Act. So, on education, actually, I'm preparing for government exams, sir. My, my fellow aspirants and all, I'm seeing there is a lack of understanding and learning uh, the concepts and all, even when we are in the higher ages. So, I... I we have already implemented and uh, implementing the NEP 2020. So I want your views on that educa in a, education in a broader view, like any, what can we do? Like, uh, how can you adopt from other countries? I, I get it, Vishwa. Next question. Yeah. Next question is uh, regarding Citizenship Amendment, Amendment Act, sir. So uh, there are many voices on this and there are many opinions on this. So I'm not getting some views, broader views on this. So I want your opinion on this. Thank you. What let, is me, the final... let me try and put things in perspective. Education. I already sir, mentioned. Sir, uh, one thing, sir, I want your answer in Telugu, sir. Uh, uh, is it okay? Uh, Dave, it's fine. As anyway, it is a discussion. Yes, sir, you can con you can answer in Telugu, sir, because most okay. of the audience are uh, aware, about, about, aware the Telugu language here. Education and Kovishwa and others. In that, Japan. 
ఏ తల్లి గర్భా నా బిడ్డ పుట్టింది అన్న కారణంగా తెలివితేటలు ఉన్నా కూడా తెలివి బయటపడే విద్య రావట్లా బట్టి పట్టడం కాపీ కొట్టడం నూటికి ఎనభై మందికి ఇవాళ ఫస్ట్ క్లాస్ లో డిస్టింక్షన్ లో బట్టి పడితే కాపీ కొడితే వచ్చేస్తున్నారు లెట్స్ బి ట్రూత్ఫుల్ స్కూల్ స్థాయిలో ఎప్పుడైతే ఫౌండేషన్ స్వీక్ ఉన్నాయో హైర్ ఎడ్యుకేషన్ ఈ ఫౌండేషన్ ఎలా నిలబడుతుంది వితౌట్ క్వాలిటీ స్కూల్ ఎడ్యుకేషన్ హైర్ ఎడ్యుకేషన్ కెనాట్ ఫ్లరిష్ దాంతో ఉన్నత విద్య కూడా నూటికి ఎనభై మంది ఏదో మార్కులతో వచ్చేస్తున్నారు కాలేజీలకి అక్కడ ఏమీ లేదు పైల పచ్చేసి అయిపోతుంది కాలేజీలో చేరడం కోసం పడంత కాంపిటీషన్ చేరాక చదువు లేదు చట్టు బండి లేదు మీరేం అనుకోవద్దు కొంచెం హార్ష్గా మాట్లాడుతున్నాం దాంతో నూటికి ఇరవై మందికే తల్లిదండ్రుల ప్రభావం వల్ల కావచ్చు అదృష్టం వల్ల కావచ్చు అవకాశం వల్ల కావచ్చు నూటికి ఇరవై మందే ఇరవై మందిలో కూడా నూటికి ఒకళ్ళిద్దరే గ్లోబల్ స్టాండర్డ్స్తో ఉన్నారు ఇండియాలో ఫ్రాంక్గా మాట్లాడుతున్నాం మిగతా వాళ్ళు కొంచెం తక్కువ ఉన్నా కూడా కష్టపడితే కొంచెం ఎదిగే అవకాశం ఉంది అందుకని ఇరవై మంది అని చెప్తున్నారు పదిహేను ఇరవై మంది అని చెప్తున్నాం మిగతా వాళ్ళకి చదువు లేదు మనం మనం మోసం చేసుకుంటున్నాం దీన్ని సమూలంగా మార్చాలంటే దేర్ ఆర్ మెనీ థింగ్స్ టు బిడన్ బట్ ది సెంట్రల్ ఇష్యూ ఇది పుస్తకాలు కాదు సిలబస్ కాదు మరొకటి కాదు ఇవన్నీ గోంగూర కబుర్లు చెప్తుంటాం సెంట్రల్ ఇష్యూ అసెస్మెంట్ విద్య నుంచి ఏం ఆశిస్తాం మనం ఆ లెవెల్స్ ఆఫ్ లెర్నింగ్ పర్టికులర్లీ అట్ స్కూల్ లెవెల్ అవి టెస్ట్ చేయడం బట్టి పట్టడం టెస్ట్ చేయడం కాకుండా ఊరికి ముక్కను పెట్టేయడం కాకుండా కాన్సెప్చువల్ అండర్స్టాండింగ్ అప్లికేషన్ ఆఫ్ దోస్ కాన్సెప్ట్స్ అండ్ నాలెడ్జ్ టు సాల్వ్ ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ కాంప్రహెన్షన్ అండ్ కమ్యూనికేషన్ అప్లయింగ్ లాజిక్ అండ్ డిరైవింగ్ రీజనబుల్ కంక్లూజన్ దిస్ ఈస్ ద పర్పస్ ఆఫ్ స్కూల్ ఎడ్యుకేషన్ దాన్ని టెస్ట్ చేయడం మొదలెట్టి దాని ప్రకారం సక్సెస్ గా డిఫైన్ చేస్తే మొత్తం సొసైటీ ఆ మార్గానికి వెళ్ళిపోతుంది ఏదో రకం తంటాలు పడతారు టీచర్లు పిల్లలు తల్లిదండ్రులు ప్రైవేట్ స్కూల్స్ మనకు ఇప్పుడు మనకు ఏదో ఏ రకంగా మార్గం లేదు ఏ రకమైన కానీ సంహోరాధ ఆ పిల్లల బుద్ధి వికసించాలి నేషనల్ ఎడ్యుకేషన్ పాలసీ ఈజ్ అ రీజనబుల్లీ గుడ్ పాలసీ ఫర్ ఫస్ట్ టైం ద వర్డ్ అవుట్ కమ్స్ ఇస్ దేర్ ఇన్ నేషనల్ ఎడ్యుకేషన్ పాలసీ దాన్ని షేప్ చేయడంలో నేను కూడా అప్లైడ్ అయ్యారు కానీ ఇన్ ఫెడరల్ సిస్టమ్ ఇన్ని రాష్ట్రాలు నూటికి తొంభై తొమ్మిది పాళ్ళు విద్య అంతా రాష్ట్రాల్లో ఉంది ఇన్ని రాష్ట్రాలు ఉన్నప్పుడు ఈ రాజకీయంగా గొడవలు ఉన్నప్పుడు మీరు జాతీయ స్థాయిలో మంచి విధానం రూపొందించి మాత్రం చేత అందరికీ అందదు ఇప్పటికి కూడా సెంట్రల్ స్కూల్స్ ఆర్ మచ్ బెటర్ జనరల్ మీరు దేశంలో మీరు చూసినట్టయితే సెంట్రల్ స్కూల్స్ యూనియన్ గవర్నమెంట్ నడిపే స్కూల్స్ అన్నీ కూడా బై అండ్ లాజ్ మంచి క్వాలిటీ ఉంటాయి అలాగే ఉన్నంతలో సిబిఎస్ఈ వై కొంచెం బెటర్ ఐసీఎస్ఈనే కాబట్టి నేషనల్ ఎడ్యుకేషన్ పాలసీ వల్ల నేషనల్ లెవెల్లో స్కూల్స్ కొంచెం బాగుపడితే అవసరంగానే చాలదు ఇది ఒక ఉద్యమం కావాలి అక్రాస్ ద బోర్డ్ ముందు అసలు మన నుంచి ప్యాషన్ కావాలి మన ఎడ్యుకేషన్ అట్ట ఉంది మన అవగాహన కావాలి చాలా మందికి అసలు ఎడ్యుకేషన్ తెలియదు వైస్ ఛాన్సలర్స్ వాళ్ళని అడుగుతుంటే యూజీ యూజీసీ చేమలను కూడా గతంలో అడిగితే ఏమైనా ఎలా ఉందంటే బ్రహ్మాండ సార్ మన ఎడ్యుకేషన్ అంటారు ఏమయ్యా ఎట్లా ఉంది మనం అమెరికా వెళ్తున్నారు సార్ అంటారు చాలా సూపర్ఫిషియల్ అండర్స్టాండింగ్ ఎంత అర్థమైన చదువు ఉందో మనకు అర్థం కాదు కానీ చాలా తేలిగ్గా మార్చుతుంది డిమాండ్ సైడ్ ఇస్ వెరీ స్ట్రాంగ్ there is not a family in india that doesn't want their children to be well educated hindu muslim rich poor urban rural upper caste lower caste tada lakunda prati okkallu mana deshamlo pillal kosam bodutaru kabatti manaku oka goppa adrushtam government board dabbu kharchu pettundi society ki vidyante meeru repothundi gana select aithe entha samrajyam chestuntaru aa worldallo entha publicity vastundi inge deshamlo itla undadu kabatti we have many things in favor demand side is very strong a lot needs to be done and i am actually working hard on that with many groups across the country and i think we are very close to that as a country chaala mandi id ardham cheskunna vallu kontha mandi ee samajamlo vastunnaru they are giving a lot of time and energy and leadership and we have to make this happen because citizenship amendment act again trivial issue political signaling chesaru kontha manasulo vallandaru aarthe unnadi endukante desha vibhajana matam karanamga jarigindi kabatti mana chuttu islamic deshalu unnai akkada islamic deshallo mari itra matalu vishayamlo మనందరికి తెలిసి ఏం జరుగుతుందో కాబట్టి వాళ్ళు రక్షణ ఇవ్వాలని చెప్పని ఒక నిర్ణయం తీసుకున్నారు దానికి పెద్ద దాని దాని గురించి అంత అర్థాంతం అక్కర్లేదు ఎందుకంటే ఏ మతమైనా కూడా పర్సిక్యూషన్ గురైతే ఇస్లాంలో ఉండి ఇస్లాం పర్సిక్యూషన్ గురైందని చెప్పంటే చాలా కష్టం అవుతుంది సమస్య మన చుట్టూ ఉన్న దేశాల్లో అలాగని ప్రపంచంలో అన్ని దేశాల్లో ఉన్న వాళ్ళందరినీ ఎకనామిక్ రెఫ్యూజీస్ గా మనం తీసుకుంటే ఈ దేశం మనమే గొప్ప దేశం కాదు గొప్ప దేశాలే ఎలా చేయట్లా రెఫ్యూజీస్ ని లేకపోతే ఇమిగ్రెంట్స్ ని కాబట్టి ఇట్ హ్యాస్ టు బి సెలెక్టివ్ మూడోది మిగతా వాళ్ళ సంగతి ఏమిటి జెన్యున్ గా నా దృష్టిలో అహ్మదియాస్ ఉన్నారు చుట్టూ ఉన్న దేశాల్లో వాళ్ళని కాల్చి తిట్టున్నారు వాళ్ళకి దేశం అవకాశం ఇవ్వాలి
ఇది కేవలం ఫాస్ట్ ట్రాక్ చేయడం కోసం ఐదేళ్లలో సిటిజన్షిప్ కోసం ఒక మార్గం ఏర్పాటు చేసింది ఈ దేశ పౌరసత్వాన్ని ఎవరు పొందాలన్నా కూడా పదకొండేళ్లలో పొందడానికి మార్గం ఆల్రెడీ ఉంది అదేం పోల దిస్ ఓన్లీ టు ఫాస్ట్ ట్రాక్ సర్టన్ గ్రూప్స్ విచ్ ఆర్ వల్నరబుల్ మన చుట్టుపక్కల ఉన్న దేశాల్లో పాకిస్తాన్లో దాదాపు ఇరవై శాతంతో ప్రారంభమైనటువంటి ఇతర మతాల జనాభా ఈవేళ ఒక్క శాతానికి ఒకటిన్నర శాతానికి గుర్తించుకుపోయింది ఇట్ ఈస్ అ ఫ్యాక్ట్ బంగ్లాదేశ్లో ముప్పై ఏళ్ల క్రితం కూడా పదిహేను ఇరవై శాతం ఇరవై ఐదు శాతం ఉన్నటువంటి ఇతర మతాల జనాభా ఇరవై ఐదు ముప్పై శాతం ఉన్నది ఈవేళ ఏడెనిమిది శాతానికి గుర్తించుకుపోయింది ఇట్ ఈస్ అ ఫ్యాక్ట్ ఆ లార్జర్ దృక్పథంలో ఒక ఫాస్ట్ ట్రాక్ ఒకటి క్రియేట్ చేశారు పట్టుకుంటే మతం కారణంగా విచ విచక్షణకు కానీ లేకపోతే హింసకు కానీ గురవుతున్న వాళ్ళకి మిగతా వాళ్ళకి ఏం అవకాశాలు పోవట్లు దీర్ఘకాలంగా ఇచ్చేది అలాగ ఉన్నది అంచేత అది అల్టిమేట్గా దీని ప్రభావం చాలా తక్కువ ఇది కొన్ని వేల మంది మీద ఉంటుంది దాన్ని మనం ఏదో పెద్ద జాతీయ సంస్కృతి తీస్తున్నాం వేర్ ఆ కంట్రీ విత్ హ్యుమంగస్ పాపులేషన్ మ్యాసివ్ ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ మనకి దృష్టి ఎప్పుడు కూడా ఆ ఎయిటీ ట్వంటీ ట్వంటీ పర్సెంట్ ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ ఎయిటీ పర్సెంట్ నంబర్ ట్వంటీ పర్సెంటే కానీ ఎయిటీ పర్సెంట్ సమస్య అక్కడి నుంచి వస్తుంది దాని మీద ఫోకస్ చేయకుండా ఈ ఫుట్ నోట్స్ మీద ఫోకస్ చేస్తూ ఉంటే మన చర్చ అంతా కూడా చాలా విస్తృతంగా కనిపిస్తుంది ఫలితం ఉండదు నిజమైన సమస్యలు దేశంలో చాలా ఉన్నాయి చట్టబద్ధ పాలన ఎట్లాగా విద్యను బాగు చేయటం ఎట్లాగా ఆరోగ్యాన్ని బాగు చేయటం ఎట్లాగా ఇకానమీ పెంచడం ఎట్లాగా ఆదాయాలు పెంచడం ఎట్లాగా ఉపాధి కల్పించడం ఎట్లాగా కోటి ముప్పై లక్షల మంది ప్రతి సంవత్సరం ఉపాధి కోసం ఎదురు చూస్తున్నారు అవన్నీ పక్కన పెట్టి పొద్దున సాయంత్రంగా మనం ఇచ్చిన చిన్న తగులు అడుగు Thank you, Iswak. Uh, let us stand up, uh, on the outcome-based education and assessment-based education rather than the traditional education so that the understanding levels of the children also will increase. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I have seen a few hand raises. Uh, respecting sir, time is to make sure that these are the last two questions we can take. Sir, Namaste, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, please introduce yourself, your name. Uh, sir, Namaste, sir. Namaste, sir. Uh, i am krishna sir a government employee from telangana sir krishna chapan uh, so, sir apart from the freebies and pay promises in the elections nowadays money and liquor are the most integral part and unavoidable part of the politics as well as in elections even though election commission of india are taking necessary measures to control the inflow of cash and uh, liquor into the community Uh, that is in the not in the practice uh, n- not up to the mark sir so in fact enhancing day by day in- enhancing day by day day by day uh, what are the remedies and uh, how to limit the impact of the liquor and cash and mm-hmm. how to end good. this uh, how to how to end this menace sir good uh, question krishna uh, good question I you are absolutely you right. on this sir you are absolutely right and i would be i mean uh, i'll be very truthful there is no mantra in the short term i have no answer i fought them all my life but i have no answer endukante if somebody a political party major party candidate says i will not distribute a rupee chances are he'll be defeated no matter who he is one in a hundred may be elected i'm not saying nobody will be elected i was elected without spending a single rupee distributing money i spent only 4 lakh 50000 rupees but that is an exception it's not the norm probably i'm the only one in the last 30 years who got elected without distributing money in andhra pradesh telangana karnataka and tamil nadu so that cannot be the norm the incentives are all wrong and election commission trying to curb it will not mean anything i guarantee you even if they uh, see some amount the actual amount that is distributed is about 10 to 15 times because they they found very inventive ways of distributing money the incentives are all wrong the law will not help if you want to criminalize this in a constituency in an assembly constituency out of the 2 lakh voters or so in each assembly constituency or 2.5 lakh voters in some states you probably have 1 lakh to 1 lakh 50000 people rural i think i call distributed money if you take a lok sabha constituency you probably have 5 or 6 lakh or 7 or 8 lakh maybe up to 10 lakh people who are distributed money now the total number of jail cells in india are only about 4 lakh for the under trials for the convicts for everybody from murder to small crimes one lok sabha constituency the number of people who are criminalized like this will not be able to be accommodated so law is not a solution 
Ivela, if you distribute money, you do you don't mean doesn't mean that you, you definitely win. If you don't distribute money, it means that in 99% cases you will lose the election. So it's a systemic problem. That's why I am arguing for proportional representation. In the short term, the way you curb money power is proportional representation. And democratization of political parties so that the candidates are chosen by the members over a period of time and they are not parachuted. And decentralization of power in the long term. In the country, in the short term, in the short term, even if you decentralize power, the vote buying in local governments is even more than an assembly and Lok Sabha because the fewer votes make a difference there. Therefore, per vote, per capita cost is higher in the local elections. But in the long term, what will happen is people understand the value of the vote. I always give the example of the apartment where I live. Now, we all pay monthly maintenance. We have chosen a team of people whom we trust to take care of whatever they are our government or representatives, let us say. The moment the lift does not function, I pick up the phone and say, Surjit Bhai, kya ho gaya? Mohit Bhai, why is the lift not functioning? Because I know I gave money to make the lift function well. I gave money to make sure that the lobby lights are all on. I gave money to make sure that the parking is good. I made I gave money to make sure that I get water supply in my apartment. I know exactly why I am voting for them, why I am paying for them. That, that clarity comes only in a local government. Local governments are schools for democracy. By centralizing government, we only have the vote and shout democracy. Most people don't even know what's happening, except that they discover that with my vote, somebody becomes the next king. That's all they understand. In a centralized government, in a poor country, illiterate country, it's inevitable. So you have to work on electoral system change, political parties, internal democracy, and strong local governments over a period of time. But the shortest route is you go for proportional representation. So I wish I could tell you, tomorrow we can stop it. We cannot. It will be a lie. But we must keep fighting. Don't lose heart. Definitely, it's a very serious distortion of our democracy. One of the flaws we discussed in our democracy. We must own it up. And we must work to change it. But I think with greater education, greater prosperity, and greater decentralization, people will increasingly be uninfluenced by money power alone. Thank you so much, sir. So we will take one question. Please respect the search time also. We can take one more question, one last question. If you have not any, we will close the session. So let me know if you have any questions in the chat at least. I hope so, that's it. So sir, thank you so much. Uh, it is uh, uh, it's really wonderful insights for us because some of our thoughts, some of our th thought process has been completely changed with a very few uh, few answers from your side. And uh, I hope this discussion will uh, useful a lot for the UPSC aspirants and the TSPSC aspirants. And even for me, even though I'm in this field since last six to seven years, I clearly able to uh, change some of my views on the anti-defection law, on the democracy indexes, on different perspectives after talking to you. It is in real and enlightened session. Thank you so much. And we started this uh, conversations with uh, uh, reputed people or the knowledgeable people. You are the first to answer. We want to start with you only because we see that this community sees that you are as the role model for us, irrespective of whether you are in this service or not. We never forget the value you added to this uh, a country in the different means. Thank you so much for accepting our request. Thank you, Siddha. So Just let me make a concluding statement. You know, so that you mentioned shibboleths. What's happening in our country is well-meaning people are going through the motions. Yes. There's no real understanding. Yes. There's no depth. Yes. Always remember evidence, logic, best practices, our own experience, innovation, and an institutional solution to alter the incentives and therefore alter the outcomes. Yes. Not this abusing each other and simply falling in line and received wisdom, standard phraseology without thinking. That is not conducive to any kind of productive outcome. In India, we all repeat the say like a parrot, many of these things without even understanding what the hell it's about. Understand the first principles of politics and governance. To be optimistic. Despite many things that are wrong, India is doing well. 75 years, we haven't done very badly. We could have done much better. We actually done pretty well. You have a long-term perspective. Things were terrible 30 years ago, 50 years ago. If somebody tells you things are wonderful then, things are bad now, 
they're talking rubbish. Trust me. Yeah. But there, there are a lot of deficiencies. Doesn't mean that everything is. We should not be smug or triumphalist. Yeah. You must have the confidence in the future, confidence in yourself, without being smug and triumphalist. Yeah. Recognize the failings honestly, and examine them critically and clinically, and find systematic solutions and work on them. So don't indulge in typical Indian kind of a discourse, which is meaningless, unintelligent, polarizing, invective, full of invective and shouting. Shouting is not an answer to the problems. Yeah. A strong man should never have to shout. It's only a weakling who pretends that he is strong who has to shout or abuse. Yeah. Strong men and women don't shout or abuse. They reason, they discuss, they debate, and they learn. They have the humility. After all this, if you bring a point of view that I did not consider adequately or you bring your evidence or logic, I guarantee you, I'm willing to listen to you and I'm going to change my perspective. That is what democracy is about. That's what growth is about. You have a wonderful future because the world is changing for the better. Technology is rapidly transforming the world in a way that never in human society we witnessed. The future is going to be much better, but there are also risks. It's not our birthright to have a wonderful life. You have to work for that collectively. And I hope that's what you will do. It doesn't matter if you get into civil services or not. If you really are passionate about it, make an effort. But don't make it a life's mission. Yes. And those who are selected, it doesn't mean that you are great people. Let me be blunt. Those who are not selected doesn't mean that you are inferior people. It's just the chance. You know, in, a, in a large examination, when lakhs of people attend. Obviously, statistically, only one in thousand get in. Or maybe fewer than one in thousand. So it doesn't make a 999 people in inadequate or useless. In fact, a lot of good is done not by the civil servants in the country, but by people fiercely determined to change the country, who have innovation, who have ideas, who have experience. It's their ideas and their work that are changing the country. Yes. So that's an option, but that's not the only option. Don't do it because of your lust for power. That's exactly what's happening in India. Yes. That is our problem. It's not a solution. Yes. So take it in the right spirit. And whatever you do, acquire skills, have the ability to think through carefully, to analyze objectively, and to be creative, to add value. Yes. Then whatever you do, you'll always be respected, you'll have a good life. I hope you'll all have good lives, and you'll all work together for the collective life because you are smart enough to recognize that for your own individual growth and happiness, collective life should be in a good shape. Yes. I wish you all the very best. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you have so a nice much. weekend. Thank you, sir. As prints are requested to stay for some time. Uh, dear aspirants, thank you so much for your joining. So this is the starting conversation with Ajay Pisar. Uh, uh, some more are coming. So in the next week, we have a session with the eight number one, Ishita Gupta. So she is going to have a conversation with the aspirants. And one more thing we want to uh, discuss is in the uh, coming Sunday, we are going to conduct a free grant test for the both uh, TSPSC prelims aspirants and the UPSC prelims aspirant. It was not in online as of now. So in Ashok Nagar, we are conducting offline. Uh, we want to restrict the total examinations. Uh, uh, the total strength of the students is hardly limited to the 75 people to the TSPSC and 75 to the UPSC. Those who are interested to write the exam in offline in Ashok Nagar, please uh, ping us. We will give you the location so that you can come there. You can write it. 